Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's Anthony Pagnata and Zach Hubbard with you guys as we've been throughout most of the offseason, and we come on to talk a little bit of Tar Heel recruiting, and this time, for the first time really in a while, it feels like the Tar Heels have had one go against them. And again, it is South Carolina who ends up getting the commitment, very similar to what we saw with Bryce Steele. Uh, Things turn quickly in the George Wilson recruitment, even quicker than Bryce Steele's recruitment. And uh, unfortunately for us, we actually recorded a podcast, um, got off, ended up putting the podcast together, sending it out through all the groups that we normally send it out through on Facebook, posting it on Twitter, and about 10 minutes after we posted all of that, feeling good about ourselves, having given you a nice preview of his commitment, he ended up completely switching everything, all the rumors started coming out, the confidence levels on the crystal balls dropped, eventually they got flipped, and as we sit here now on Tuesday night, when we are recording the podcast, George Wilson is now a South Carolina Gamecock. And, uh, you know, look, Zach, this caught us completely off guard. We're still kind of unclear as to what exactly changed behind the scenes. There are some rumors coming out today that really he maybe wasn't as sold on Carolina as some thought, uh, that Tony Grimes was playing a really huge role in his recruitment. And once he reclassified, that kind of just changed everything for him. Uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense still to me, but what do you make of the Tar Heels missing out on one of their biggest targets at weak side defensive end? Yeah, so like you said, and like we talked about in the previous podcast, basically at the end of the podcast, because then we said, you know, it would take something crazy for George Wilson to not end up in the class, and crazy happened, and you know, that's just sort of the, you know, the unpredictability of recruiting there, but yeah, it seems like that there was a, you know, a big shift in momentum around that time, or it might have been, as you said, um, that it could have been that there was a lack of, um, you know, a lack of real clarity on where he was going prior, and it may have just been some some bad guesses, uh, you know, a rare miss on the part of people that seem to be in the know. Uh, I mean, even going into that Friday evening, South Carolina sources were saying, you know, that the staff had not been, or that whether I should say the South Carolina staff had not been, um, had not been told that they were going to be the selection as of yet. So it sounds, at least from what I've gathered, that. Um, even though that North Carolina felt good and sources felt good about North Carolina, it may have been a situation in which um, Wilson played it a little bit closer to the chest, perhaps, than a lot of sources believed, and then you know had his own, um, I guess, you know, hierarchy that was different than what pretty much everyone thought. And then you know, as you saw, um, it ended up with him choosing the South Carolina Gamecocks as opposed to the Tar Heels. 
Yeah, one of the big things for him that I think is very interesting is that he hasn't been on campus in Columbia yet. Um, now the question is, is will he get a chance to visit campus? They don't really know, but he did take one of the virtual campus tours, and some people believe that that could be a thing that changed his recruitment. You kind of wonder if you know Carolina maybe wasn't able to give him one of those virtual tours. I don't really know. I haven't heard of any prospects that have taken the virtual tour just yet. Um, um, but I know that uh, coming up, that Carolina is probably going to have to utilize that maybe a little more than they've utilized it to this point. Um, and a lot of people are still looking at George Wilson as a guy that Carolina has a chance somewhere down the line to potentially flip. Uh, I got a lot of questions about whether Zaire Patterson is another guy that they could look to flip. And the ultimate answer, I think, is yes, they will look to flip those guys. But I don't know if, uh, if, if this is maybe the same opinion that you carry. I think in this class, it's going to be very hard to flip guys because really guys are just going off of their relationship with coaching staffs, maybe what they know about the program as a whole. If they were able to take visits there at one time, um, maybe you know as, as during last season or even earlier than that, those are kind of what these guys are having to go off of. And I feel like one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of these decisions be moved up probably earlier than they would have is because a lot of guys are starting to come to the realization that they will not be able to get on campus for visits this fall. Whether football is played this fall or not, they're probably not going to let recruits on campus. I think that's one of the things that's going to be a real challenge when it comes to trying to flip either Patterson or Wilson. Is that how you kind of feel as well? I think so, yeah. I mean, you look at the situations and you'll have some people that say, you know, why would you commit to a school or why would, you know, this guy hasn't com- hasn't visited a school, he hasn't visited South Carolina. So it could be a situation where, um, you know, it could be a flip down the line where he's been to a North Carolina or Penn State in the past. And, you know, to that, I would have the response of if he hasn't, if hasn't visited and he's committing – Nothing's going to change between now and early signing day or national signing day. You know, more likely than not, there's not going to be fall visits for these guys. So really, mm-hmm. you know, most of these recruits have all of the information on any school that they're going to get. You know, there is still the question of we're having more commits than we've had in the past at this point. So there is very much a possibility of, you know, having to do commitments in the fall and in the winter. But it's really hard to predict any of those at this time just because, you know, like I said, recruits pretty much have all the information that they're going to have. They're making decisions based on that. And it, it, there's more likely than not going to be some campus visit that's going to, you know, establish a feeling with these guys and change their minds. So at this point, you know, it's really hard to see how North Carolina is going to get involved with guys like George Wilson, guys like Zaire Patterson, when they couldn't pull off those commitments at their initial point in the spring and here into the summer. Yeah, and I feel like the reason that a lot of people are still really trying to be sort of positive and and think that there's a chance that one of those guys could flip is that I think a lot of people are maybe not concerned, but would still like to add another guy at that weak side defensive end position. Now, I know there are some people that have sort of been of the mindset that, look, Carolina's brought in a really good defensive line class in each of the past two classes, and they're doing so once again here in 2021. But I think the thing that people got to remember is that when we talk about the rush end position, which is the position that we would kind of project George Wilson, Zaire Patterson to play, they're smaller frame guys, usually a long athletic player. Um, you know, I, right now it's t- it's Timon Fox who plays that position. And again, he's a little bit bigger. He's kind of around 255. Most of the guys that you're going to typically see there will probably be 235, 245. Um, but really, Really, you know, you're just looking for a guy that has the athleticism that he can basically play sort of a 3-4 outside linebacker type position. You're looking for a guy that can beat somebody with speed off the outside, a guy that can help you in the run game. And I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of people just don't realize is that a lot of the guys that we've seen commit to the class, the highly rated guys, even in this class, Keyshawn Silver uh, as well as Javari Ritzy. I mean, look, Keyshawn Silver's in the mid-270s now. Same thing with Javari Ritzy. 
while both of those guys are athletic, that's a lot to ask for them to basically play a linebacker type role, which is what you're going to basically be as a rush end. Um, I, they project more for that four eye defensive end position. Same thing with a guy like Miles Murphy, who we've talked a lot about. Um, even guys like AJ Beattie. I mean, that's the thing is that when you look at that position, there really isn't a ton of depth there. I mean, we talked about it heading into his commitment. You know, Timon Fox is a senior. So is Tyrone Hopper, who looks like he's going to play that position as well. Those are two seniors that'll be gone, leaving you with a guy in Chris Collins that we just don't really know a whole lot about. I think extremely talented guy, could really thrive at the position. Um, but of course, last year, didn't play, ended up redshirting. You got Dez Evans, who's an extremely talented freshman coming in. Um, you know, I, I, We expect that he's going to really adjust to that role. No worries about him. He, he should probably fit that role perfectly. That's why they recruited him for that spot. But then outside of that, it's really a big question mark. You know, does A.J. Beattie kind of fit that position, or is he more of a straight-line rusher? I think he's more of a straight-line, four-eye type guy. He's 250, so they'll probably add a little more weight to him. But you never know. If he could end up uh, at that position. Uh, Kamen Rucker is another guy that I just don't think a lot of people really remember in that class because he's kind of towards the bottom, but is an extremely talented guy. He probably projects more to that rush end position, but could also just be a regular outside linebacker too, because he's got that, that, that skill set as well. So, I mean, there's some things to consider there, but I still feel like this is a position where they're going to need somebody in this class. I know there's a good amount of talent in the next class, the position. Malachi Hamrick is the big name that everybody's going to be talking about, the in-state guy from Shelby. But do you think, Zach, that they need a defensive end in this class, or a rush end, I should say, in this class to sort of help at a spot that right now, because it's still so new, this is a new element of uh, Jay Bateman's defense that wasn't here before at Carolina. This is something that they need to add a guy for depth? I think they do. I mean, you mentioned uh, four guys that we're sure about in uh, Tamon Fox, Tyron Hopper, Chris Collins, and Desmond Evans. You're more likely than not, you have a fifth there in Kamon Rucker, but that's just five guys, you know, on scholarship that you're going to have this upcoming season. You're going to lose two of those in Fox and Hopper. That leads you with three. So, I mean, looking at the 2021 class, there's not really a lot of options that you have. I mean, you have two sort of four eye guys, and Silver and Ritzy committed. You have an athlete type in Gabe Stevens that maybe he plays outside linebacker or rush into this defense, but you know, there's a lot of different things you could do. He could play potentially inside, could play secondary, could be kind of that linebacker safety hybrid. That's how they want to use him. So, you know, I do think that they need another one um, due to the fact that within sort of the 3 4 defense, even though Jay Bateman isn't running your typical 3 4 defense, he's obviously got his own spin on it and, um, you know, sort of own way he likes to run it. It's more likely than not, it's a position that I think most people would say there needs to be, at least in this class, one more guy, um, whether that be um, a freshman or an incoming freshman, I should say, from the 2021 class or potentially one where they look at the transfer portal. I think that's an option as well where you could look and see maybe there's a guy that's coming from the sort of group of five conferences or even from Division two ranks that you know has high upside and could at the very least you know offer something in terms of depth just so that you have, you know, the requisite number of bodies in the position that you can play guys but still rotate. Um, I absolutely, I think they need someone else, and I think at least at this point, and obviously, you know, as we've discussed multiple times, there's always time in the process where you can have a guy come on the board later, and I don't think that, you know, North Carolina's looking to take someone now just to take someone, but I do think by the time that, um, you know, by the time that the 2021 class enrolls, either in the spring or in the, in the summer um, of next year, that they do need to have at least one more guy there to play that outside linebacker or rush in position. Yeah, and the transfer portal is definitely an interesting spot, and I think they could end up going there. As you mentioned, Gabe Stevens is interesting. Uh, I, the, the only thing that concerns me about him is that 
if he ends up playing that position, you're going to have to probably put about 30 or 35 pounds on his frame because he's only 205. He's a smaller guy. I thought he kind of fit more of the hybrid linebacker safety type position because he's got the coverage skills because he played corner, what was very successful in his first couple of years of playing corner at the high school level, was a four-star corner before he kind of shifted to that athlete type position where you know he can kind of play multiple positions on your defense. So it's going to be interesting to see how Carolina ends up using him. That's one of those guys that I think is kind of a question mark about where he ultimately ends up, but it's not really a bad thing. There's so many different things that you can do with him, so he's definitely a guy to keep an eye on. Now, there are some guys that Carolina could potentially look at. I wrote an article that's on the website. You guys can go and check it out. I'm not really going to go too in-depth on some of these guys. Um, I know one name that a lot of people sort of kind of threw out uh, some of the groups that I'm, I'm in and kind of threw out that they saw was an offer. They don't really know where he's at. That's Kevin Gilliam, the defensive line, uh, the weak side defensive end. I should say, from Highland Springs, Virginia. Uh, He's a guy that Carolina hasn't really established a great relationship with. He's got a top 10. You would think, you know, Carolina could have a chance at him if they wanted to, but he doesn't really fit exactly what Carolina's looking at. He's 6'3", 250. He's, you know, if you watch his film, he looks more like a four-eye technique. And again, I think Carolina's good there. The other guy is Alex Okello, who comes out of Nashville, Tennessee, Pearl Cohen High School. Um, And I watched his film, kind of an interesting guy. I mean, look, he's only 6'5", 217, so he would have to put on a lot of weight. Um, And, you know, the other thing that that we just don't really know about him, you know, the level of competition I don't really think is great, but there are some things to like about him. I think he's a little more physical than some of the other guys that I talked about in the article, Um, but still, I, I don't think Carolina really has a strong connection with him. The only difference with him is he doesn't seem as far along in his recruitment. Now, there are a couple other guys that I threw up there. There's two in state guys that are very interesting, but the guy that I think Carolina should offer, and if you want to go back and watch his film, it's a great one to watch, is three-star weak side defensive end Deontay Anderson, who comes from Fort Meade uh, High School in Fort Meade, Florida. And uh, I I threw on this guy's film, and I'm going to be honest, it rivaled George Wilson's film. Very long guy, 6'5". I'm I'm not entirely sure on the weight, um, but really, I mean, quick off the line of scrimmage, has some physicality to him. Uh, And the other good thing is, still very early, it looks like, in his recruitment process. This feels like, just from looking at his profile, because I haven't really been, you know, this isn't a guy that's really been on the radar for that long. I feel like this is a guy that probably was, you know, a late bloomer, just somebody that's kind of come onto the scene here, maybe went out to a camp and played really well. All of a sudden, people uh, got his film right before COVID uh, shut everything down. Because this guy, I mean, as of right now, doesn't have any schools that seem to be the leader for him. And this looks like a group where if Carolina wanted to jump in, they would have a shot with schools like Central Florida, Georgia Tech, Nebraska, South Carolina, and Virginia Tech being the prob- the, the biggest named schools, I think, in his recruitment. Now, there's a couple of in-state schools, Florida Internationals in there, a couple of smaller schools like that, but... Yet you don't have Florida in there. You don't have Florida State. And I think Florida is a place where Carolina is going to have to recruit pretty well over the next few seasons because, as we've seen, you know, the talent this year in the state of North Carolina is phenomenal. That's not going to stay for long, though. It's going to kind of change a little bit in coming years. This is a historic class. I still think there's going to be a lot of talent in the state, but Carolina is going to have to go other places to find talent. Florida could be one of those areas, and this could definitely help. Again, I'm not saying that he's going to get an offer, but this is a guy that I think is at least worth looking up and could be a name to at least keep an eye on going forward uh, in this recruitment cycle. So we move from that to another guy that's going to announce his commitment. Just announced on Monday that he will make his announcement uh, public on Friday, and that is Uh, four-star offensive tackle Logan Taylor, another guy that it really felt like Carolina fans had kind of penciled in. They thought this was a guy that was, you know, locked in on Carolina. Um, I think that was 
potentially the case when Bryce Steele was being heavily recruited by the Tar Heels. I feel like once he ended up going to South Carolina, the relationship between Taylor and North Carolina wasn't as strong. I still think there's a decent relationship there, but ultimately it feels like he's going to end up staying in state. I, I, you would say he goes to uh, Episcopal High School in Alexandria, Virginia, but Episcopal is a place where really just a lot of guys end up coming from different locations, transferring in uh, to the school. Uh, he comes from actually Canada. That's where he's been at for most of COVID-19. So it's been really hard to get a great read on him. But all of a sudden, the other day, a whole bunch of crystal balls came in for Virginia. And as of right now, that feels like where he's ultimately going to go. Um, I don't think that, you know, you probably have a different opinion, Zach. But, uh, you know, this is another one. Carolina, I think some fans, believe it or not, somehow are getting concerned about the fact that Carolina is going to miss on another four-star prospect and a guy that they had penciled in. Um, do you think that Taylor ends up going to Virginia, or do you think Carolina maybe still has a chance? I think that he most likely ends up going to Virginia. I think something that's important to point out in the case of Taylor's recruitment is that he had never visited North Carolina, and that was always going to be mm-hmm. a big piece of the puzzle here was getting him on campus. Obviously, you know, he most likely had Zoom calls and things like that with the staff, text conversations, everything along those lines. But he hadn't actually been to the campus. And being from Canada, not really being, you know, in the college football scene as much outside of his, you know, actually playing football in high school, um, one of the things that's been discussed in his recruitment is that he, you know, may not have um, a great knowledge of the different schools, may not have, you know, comfortability with a lot of schools. So, you know, you have a school there uh, in UVA that's sort of close to where he goes to high school. So it's a place that he's comfortable with. He understands the area. And um, I think, you know, the shift, the quote unquote shift that we've seen in this recruitment is uh, one that we've seen, you know, in recruitments for schools all over college football where uh, COVID-19 has had an effect on the recruitment. Mm-hmm. Had there been summer visits, you know, maybe North Carolina would have got them in, been able to shore up sort of the perceived lead they had going into the spring. But just a situation where, you know, the lack of visits really more likely than not hurt North Carolina. And I think, you know, going into Friday, more likely than not, it will be the University of Virginia. Yeah, I think you're right. When you look at this, this is another one of those ones that kind of revolves around the situation that we talked about earlier. If in the fall, for you know, somehow guys are able to get on campus for visits, that would be huge. And I think this is one of the main guys that it would help with. I think Carolina could potentially flip him if they were to get him on campus in the fall. Because this feels like a guy that even though he'll commit to Virginia, if things open back up, the race for him might not be over just yet because of everything that you just said, not really as familiar with the recruiting landscape, hasn't really probably been as in touch with the recruiters as some of the other guys So in this class. So it's going to be interesting. But I think, you know, going in, Carolina is probably going to see this one go against them. Um, but I think that one of the main things is, is that Carolina fans – have to take a breather here because this is still a historic class. This class is loaded. Um, You know, we mentioned weak side defensive end is probably still a need. We've talked about tight end. We've talked about defensive tackle being needs. The good news is it looks like at the moment they're at least focusing on trying to get those needs taken care of. And I don't think weak side defensive end is as big of a need there. As you mentioned, they can go into the transfer portal and get someone if they need to. But I think, you know, there, there was a lot of panic that all of a sudden, well, Carolina's missed on George Wilson. Now they've missed on Logan Taylor, it appears. And we fully expect that Peyton Page will not be coming to Carolina. It's pretty much down to Clemson or Tennessee. Um, I don't think there's a huge reason for concern here. Maybe that's just me, but I feel like this class is still in a really good spot. When you talk about Logan Taylor, the offensive tackle position is perfectly fine. I feel like they just, they really looked at 
Logan Taylor as a guy that was talented enough to where they were making room for him in the class. They didn't necessarily need another offensive tackle. Keep in mind that Eli Sutton is still in this class. Carolina brought in two offensive tackles in the last class in Trey Zimmerman and Caden Baker. And that's really not an area where they need to be that concerned. It feels like offensive tackle has the number of bodies there. Going into this season, if the season is played, it's more about the experience at the position, not the depth. So the, I, I'm not really getting the, the the big uproar over potentially losing Logan Taylor. I don't think it's great. I mean, we shouldn't be having a party about it. But at the same time, I don't feel like it should be as big of a concern as many people are communicating it to be. Do you think at, at, at that right now there should really be any sort of concern from this fan base about missing on some of these guys? Well, Logan Taylor... In uh, particular, like you mentioned, um, he, he was really a best of sort of pickup, as they call him. Just like if you have another spot where you can put a guy that you feel is an elite guy, that's really what his spot was for. Uh, they met the offensive line requirement with Eli Sutton and Jared Wilson. Um, now, I mean, you, you combine the Logan Taylor potential miss with that of George Wilson, and I have seen people that have had concerns. And I, you know, to those people, I just want to point out a few things. Tar Heel class is currently ranked number three in the nation. It has the number seven, seventh overall player in Tony Grimes committed, who more likely than not will enroll here in August, uh, reclassifying to the 2020 class. And all of this, you know, recruiting change is coming after a, a seven and six season and then a two win and a three win season before those. So uh, I think that, you know, anything that we look at in terms of recruiting always has to be put into that perspective. And I mentioned it before, and I'm going to mention it again, just how far Matt Brown has moved this Tar Heel program and the recruiting prowess of this Tar Heel program. So no, I don't think that Carolina fans should be worried about either of these guys. Obviously we mentioned, you know, maybe a, a roster need, for rush in or, or outside linebacker, but mm-hmm. recruiting couldn't be much better right now um, unless they were in you know the number one class or something like that, pulling seven five stars a year, something ridiculous like that. Right. This is about as good as you can get, and anyone in, you know in the country is going to take a class like this. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to think that just about two weeks ago we were sitting here after the commitment from Tony Grimes. This is a historic class. Right now, Carolina is one of the hottest teams on the recruiting trail, if not the hottest, because you know, with, even though Tennessee's landed a lot of guys, they really don't have the talent that Carolina has in the class because Carolina picks up a five-star commitment, their first since 09. Now, you know, Tony Grimes is going to reclassify. He kind of confirmed that the other day. Will enroll in August. Uh, you know, that that was something that was pretty much rumored for about a month. Um, they were really just waiting on whether or not the Virginia High School League would uh, would make it official. They haven't really said anything, but they're just going to kind of assume, like I think we all can assume, that high school football probably won't be played in many states in the fall and went ahead and uh, chose to move classes to the 2020 class um, and at, I think this is a trend that we're going to see you know for a couple of guys here at the top of this 2021 class it's definitely something to keep an eye on um, I saw some talk about that on social media today you never know there could be other guys that end up moving out of this class as well for Carolina if they're that close to being able to graduate um, but that's a different topic for a different time I mean even look I mean once Grimes if he does once he ends up enrolling in August and he moves out of the 21 class that would still only drop this class one spot to fourth this is still a phenomenal class as you mentioned this team won five games in two years a couple years ago when they hired Mac Brown what were we told we were told that this was him just trying to basically fancy up the job fluff it up a little bit so that when it hit the market in a couple of years it would be at, at least somewhat of a desirable job nobody thought that Carolina was going to be at the point that they're at right now. Um, and I think that, you know, there's there's definitely some areas where Carolina is going to have to land people in this class. But it, so that that's every school out there. I mean, Alabama, Clemson, all of them, they always have needs in these classes. 
even when they put together these historic ones. So Carolina, uh, the, the staff has done a great job to this point. There's no reason to believe that they don't have a chance. And the other thing that I want to mention when you talk about George Wilson's commitment before we kind of close this thing down, you have to remember that with George Wilson, this was a uh, an, an area you know where Carolina really hadn't ventured into outside of Tony Grimes before this. We saw a huge wave of offers come in after Tony Grimes and them started seriously talking, and George Wilson was one of those guys that was in it. He was a guy that was in the 2021 class, had a top seven. Carolina comes in in the middle of May, and by the end uh, or by the end of June, heading into his commitment here in early July, was a heavy favorite couple of days before, they were easily the heavy favorite. Most people thought it was pretty much a shoe-in for them that they were going to land him and add him to this class. So, I mean, in, in past years, there's no way Carolina would have been able to do that. There was no recruitment where they went in against big-time Power 5 schools like we're seeing going after a lot of these guys that Carolina is going after uh, and, and being able to hold, not only hold their own, but in this case, come out of nowhere, completely jump ahead of programs like Penn State, like Virginia Tech in-state, all those types of programs, and make themselves the favorite at the time before, of course, something changed behind the scenes that we couldn't see. So I'm not really that concerned. I know you're not really that concerned. Um, I think the biggest thing, the one last uh, point that we'll talk about before we get out of here, is I think everybody now wants to know who are the guys that we should potentially expect could be a part of this Carolina class. I feel like, you know, when we talk about defensive tackle, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins is the name that everybody talks about. Bryson Nesbitt is now going to be a huge focus with Logan Taylor and George Wilson off the board as well. In-state tight end, position of need, um, and a a very talented guy at that, and a a guy that is still trending up some boards because he's been able to get out to some seven-on-sevens and stuff and put in some really good work. But I think after that, there's a little bit of a question mark. Is there anybody else maybe that you're thinking about right now that that, that maybe Tar Heel fans should keep in their heads over the next couple of weeks? Well, like you mentioned, uh, Bryson Nesbitt definitely won. I think at least two others to mention uh, that we've discussed on prior podcasts are uh, outside of page, page two of the other defensive line targets that are kind of being targeted as a uh, as a, a best of position. Um, and Tyrion Ingram Dawkins and uh, Tyleek Williams, both those guys still on the board, both have um, some sizable Carolina interest there. Um, with Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, there's still the sort of barrier of the perceived trio of South Carolina, Tennessee, and UGA being heavy players in there. Uh, but, you know, North Carolina definitely still recruiting, definitely seeing some recruiting on social media with them. Tyler Williams recently released the top six that still had North Carolina in it. So I think those are both guys, you know, that you'll see um, North Carolina continue to recruit. And like we said previously, there will always be guys that will come up at some point um, you know, just in the process, you're always recruiting, you're always getting new guys. We've seen even with Tony Grimes, you know, there's the potential more and more for uh, not only basketball players, but football players, if they have the credits to reclassify. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you're in recruiting, there's all number of possibilities. And I think the sort of recruit recruiting mojo that North Carolina's got with it right now, I, I'm not worried about it for you know, any position here in the 2021 class. Yeah, the one guy that I'll add to that is a guy that's currently co- committed to Miami, Andres Borregales, who's the kicker. Um, he has said, uh, uh, according to a couple of people that I know that are around the program, he has told them that he wants to be able to get on campus and take a visit. I think he's the guy that um, I heard was potentially looking at taking a virtual tour of campus here soon. Um, so that's another name to keep an eye on at a kicker position where Carolina's had some ups and downs over the past few years. Of course, we remember this past year, Noah Ruggles after the Virginia Tech game gets benched. Jonathan Kim comes in. Um, that lasted about a half, and then they went back to Ruggles. But they're looking for a little more consistency there. Of course, this year bringing in Grayson Atkins, the transfer from Furman, but he'll 
he'll only be a one-year guy. So that's another name to keep an eye on. But uh, yeah, I think that's the group. Um, Tyreek Williams is 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 kind of confusing. I know a lot of people are kind of all over the place on him. There have been some rumors that maybe Carolina was out on him, wasn't really recruiting him anymore. But it still seems like there's a good relationship between him and the rest of the players in uh, in this class. The staff seems to be still kind of talking to him. So I'm not sure how how true those rumors really are. I think we'll just have to kind of wait and see with him. Um, but yeah, that was the, the group, those are the group of guys to keep an eye on. And I feel like Carolina, as we've said, the number here is probably about 21 or 22. I think it still holds at that um, with even when Grimes reclassifies, it, it would drop just one, so 20 or 21. Um, and if you look at those guys that we talked about, it'll probably be one of the defensive linemen. We're looking at Nesbitt or a tight end somewhere. So that kind of leaves a spot or two open. So there could be some other guys that kind of pop up as targets over the next couple of weeks and months to keep an eye on. And of course, we'll have you covered with all of that on the Heel Tough Blog podcast and also over on the website at HeelToughBlog.com. So that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the podcast. want to thank Zach for uh, stopping in with us, hosting the podcast tonight. Of course, we encourage you guys to head to the website, HeelToughBlog.com. You can check out all of the stuff in reaction to George Wilson's uh, commitment to South Carolina, how that affects North Carolina. There's an article there uh, where we, uh, of course, uh, uh, go over um, why he ended up going away from North Carolina to South Carolina. We try to d- dive into that a little bit before uh, we tell you where Carolina's focus turns next. Um, and then, of course, I also put out an article uh, yesterday uh, sort of looking at some of the guys that could be the next uh, group of targets that Carolina has at that weak side defensive end position. As I mentioned, a couple in-state guys that you can look at there. Both of those guys are committed, so they could be interesting guys that if Carolina Carolina throws an offer, maybe they reconsider. Um, And then, of course, uh, there's a little bit more information on Deontay Anderson, who I talked about on here. You guys can go and check that out on the website. And, of course, uh, we encourage you to go back, listen to old editions of the podcast, and you can go onto any of your podcast players, feeds, any of those. You can find it. The Heel Tough Blog podcast is on there. Uh, Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Rating and reviewing moves us up the rankings on some of these major podcast platforms so that other people who haven't quite found the show yet can find the show, listen to all these great editions of the podcast, Listen to me and Zach. Listen to me and Josh. Listen to all the great interviews that we had in the offseason. And when you subscribe, that makes sure that you are subscribed to the feed so you don't miss any of those editions of the podcast. Make sure you do that. Uh, So uh, that'll wrap it up. Thank you guys for listening to this edition of the podcast. And as always, go Tar Heels! Go Tar Heels!